Daddy, my daughter Sasha said. You have to come to school tomorrow to meet my new teacher. What happened to your old teacher, Mrs. Greendale? I asked. Her husband had a heart attack, so she'll have to stay home and take care of him for the rest of the school year, she replied. I liked Mrs. Greendale. She was an old school teacher. No newfangled parent blaming crap existed for her. I never had to go up to school unless Sasha did something stupid. Can't your mom meet her at the PTA meeting? I asked. I'd rather you meet her. Mom's been acting so weird lately, Sasha said. Okay, Angel, I'll try to get there, but I'm not promising anything, I said. Teacher meetings obviously fall under your mom's jurisdiction. My name is Lucas McCain. I'm a representative of Devlin International. I'm 35, soon to be 50. I'm five feet tall, have brown hair and brown eyes. I'm in pretty good shape thanks to my daily jogging, and I love my wife and daughter more than anything in the world. My wife Dana was one of the driving forces behind the school PTA, or whatever the modern term is. Dana was short, about five feet tall. At least that's what she swore. Every time I measured her, she turned out to be four feet eleven inches tall. She was slim, with a nice figure. We had been married for fourteen years now, and had been spoiling our daughter for the last ten of those years. We had eight more years to go until Sasha left for college. But Sasha was right about one thing. Dana was acting weird again. The last time she acted that way was because she was pregnant with Sasha. She was trying to figure out everything we would need to have and do to make the pregnancy easier before she told me. I think I was pretty much to blame for this because I never showed any interest in children. But from the first day my little angel was born, from the moment I personally cut her umbilical cord and slapped her butt, she was daddy's little girl. Dana arrived a little later and headed straight for the shower. She had been doing that a lot lately, maybe once or twice a week. I didn't think anything of it because women always take baths and showers much more often than guys. Looking back now, I think I was stupid or at least ignorant. But let's face it, most of us are. We get married because we love the other person so much that we want them to be a permanent part of our lives. Part of that love is the fact that we trust them in several ways. We trust that they will not hurt us. We trust that they will be faithful to us. We just don't expect the person we promise to spend the rest of our lives with to stab us in the back. Let's face it, love makes us ignorant. If you're constantly looking over your shoulder, expecting the apple of your eye to cheat on you, then your relationship sucks. Kick that bitch to the curb right now. Trust me, if you can't let your guard down around her, then you don't truly love her. I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking, if my old lady was running after me, I'd know about it. When that happens to you, trust me, you'll be as clueless as me, but maybe not as lucky. Anyway, the next day I showed up at Sasha's school just in time to pick her up. The only thing it took for me to pick her up was to pick my jaw off the floor. The woman standing in front of Sasha's class was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She was wearing jeans and a nice blouse. When I entered the room, she had her back turned to me. When she turned to face me, I was mesmerized by her smile and the volume of red hair that cascaded down her shoulders. Her figure wasn't as good as my wife's, but who cared? I sat looking at her for a long time until I realized she was addressing me. They just didn't make teachers like this in my childhood. She was tall, at least for a woman. She was about 5 feet 8 inches tall, and she was much slimmer than Dana. Not that I was comparing them, but she was stunning. Yes, that's a good word for her, stunning. Dad! Sasha called out. Miss. Marshall is talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry, I stammered. I'm just brainwashed. Yep. Sasha's dad. Mr. McCain, um, Lucas McCain. But you can just call me Luke. I held out my hand, and she shook it warmly and gave me another of her smiles. Damn it, she must sell those smiles. I apologize for calling you out on such short notice, she said, smiling again. I'm new here, but the school takes parental involvement very seriously. Sasha is probably one of my brightest and friendliest students. She's also one of the most responsive. She had a soft southern accent that seemed to stretch each syllable for several. I could probably listen to this woman forever. I smiled at Sasha. I was proud of her. She smiled back, holding out her hand. I high-fived her and slapped her hand sharply. She looked at me like I had a weak mind. Daddy, when someone holds out their hand, you have to put money in it, she whined. In any case, Miss Marshall continued, neither you nor your wife participated in any of our projects or committees this year. Miss Marshall, please call me Gianna, she said. Doesn't the PTA count? I asked. Yes, of course, she smiled. Are you on the PTA? 
Well, no, I said. But my wife does. She attends all these meetings on Wednesdays. She's never missed one. Miss Marshall's face changed before her eyes. Maybe I'm wrong, she said. But the PTA meets on Tuesdays and only on the third Tuesday of every month. My face went down too. I had to find out what was going on with Dana. Why don't you pick one of our committees or clubs to get involved in, she said. And if your wife ends up on the PTA, you'll be protected. She said all this with a lot of sympathy in her voice. It was as if she knew what I was going through. I looked over the list of events and settled on Trek. I think I could help with that, I said. I'm no expert, but I run every day and have done a few marathons. That would be perfect, she said. They meet Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 o'clock. On the way home, Sasha and I stopped at McDonald's. It wasn't a very nutritious dinner, but she loves it, and I wouldn't have to cook. I knew Dana had no chance of getting ahead of us, even though she left work before I did. Some guys like to sit in their favorite chairs and think, while others like to take long walks. My favorite activity for thinking was washing my red Mustang GT. After rinsing the car, I began to put my thoughts on Dana's behavior in order. I knew that parent-teacher conferences were only once a month, not every week. Dana joined the PTA almost two months ago. That meant that everything she had done, she had done about six or eight times. While I was washing my car, I called my friend. Hey, Hop, I said into the phone. Hey, Luke, what's up? He asked. Shit, he laughed. Remember when you thought Tia was cheating on you? What was the name of the agency you used? Oh, God, don't remind me of that, he laughed. All I've done is make a few lawyers and a few private investigators richer. Well, I told you she wasn't cheating on you, I said. She took classes at the community college because she thought you were embarrassed by her accent and limited English. Yeah, I remember, he laughed. Anyway, the agency was called Ponderosa Investigations. They're in the book and they're good. Thanks, Hop, I said and hung up. I had known Hop Singh since the days when we played baseball. I called the information desk and was given the number for Ponderosa Investigations. I called them and was told they would be there in a few minutes, as they were very close to my house. I was polishing my Hilo T's chrome rims when a car pulled up. I saw the man who got out of the car pull out a pair of sunglasses and put them on. Your chrome is so bright I thought I was going to go blind, he said. My father had a 197302 boss, and he took care of it just like you did this car. I nodded. I liked old Mustangs, too. I'm Lucas McCain, I said, extending my hand. My friends call me Luke. I stood up and looked at him. Joseph Cartwright, he replied. His handshake was firm, and I believed him. He didn't look like the usual tall private investigator. In fact, he was only five feet four inches tall. My friends call me Little Joe. I realized where the name came from. Why don't we go inside and talk, I said. On the way to the house, I explained my suspicions to him. He looked around the house and told me about the packages they had. He ended up putting a recording device on his phone. I gave him her cell phone number, and since I was paying the bill, he told me that they would be able to track those calls as well. He then installed several tiny cameras throughout the house. I had the choice of watching the camera footage myself or ordering a weekly or daily DVD. I chose the cheaper option, the weekly DVD. How much will it cost? I asked him. How much are you willing to pay for peace of mind? He replied. That told me it was going to be pretty damn expensive. In the end, one way or another, you'll decide it was worth it, he smiled. Okay, explain to me what it is, I said. If she's not cheating, you'll be able to forget about all those nasty suspicions, he said. You'll be able to trust her again and work on making your marriage stronger. All the stress this has put on you will be over, and you'll be able to relax. He exhaled, letting it all go. I realized what he was getting at. On the other hand, if she's cheating, you won't only find out about it. You'll have all the evidence you need to confront her or even divorce her if necessary, he says. That way, no one will be able to make a fool of you by telling you about some scrappy affair that lasted years. You'll be able to move on with your life one way or another. We'll be in touch, he said, pulling away. I went back to polishing the car. About a half hour after he left, Dana came home. She was cheerful and came over to sit with me and watch me work. This was something new. Dana, I don't like anyone looking over my shoulder while I'm working, I said. You're not doing anything wrong, it's me. It just gets on my nerves. Okay, honey, I'll see you when you get here, she said. After I came in from the car wash, Dana sat next to me while I watched TV. 
She was suddenly so damn friendly. I got up and went into the shower. When I got out of the shower, she was still there. I sat down in the chair instead of on the couch. I'm going to bed, she said. Going to bed? I'll be there soon. I just want to watch the news, I said. I pretended to fall asleep on the couch. When she came in ostensibly to wake me up and send me to bed, I just rolled over as if I were deeply asleep. The next morning I got up earlier than usual. I got ready for work and grabbed a cup of coffee. Dana and Sasha were just piling into the kitchen as I was leaving. I kissed my daughter goodbye and Dana looked in the refrigerator. By the time she realized I was leaving, the door had already closed. She called me at work that morning. Hey, you left without saying goodbye to me this morning, she said. What did I do? What do you mean, Dana? I asked. We've been married for 14 years and together for 16. If we're not mad at each other, you kiss me goodbye every morning and tell me you love me. Sometimes you do that to melt the ice when we're mad at each other. I know it sounds silly to you, but it helps me start the day off right. When I leave the house every morning, it makes me feel good to know that someone loves me. It makes me feel special. I'm sorry, Dana. I'll try not to forget that, I said. What happened to you last night? She asked. What do you mean, Dana? I asked. Well, I was excited, she said. I just let it go. I had the good sense not to say the first thing that came into my head. If I had said, I'm sure whoever you're having fun with will appreciate it. That would only let her know that I had her figured out. Since I didn't have proof yet, I saw no reason to stir up what may not have been a problem. I was taking Hop Singh's lesson to heart. Oh, I wanted to remind you that I have, she began. I know you have a parent-teacher conference today, Dana, I said coldly. I'll talk to you later at work. I hung up the phone. Screw the Hop Singh class, I thought. There's no way I'm going to stand by and let this continue. Once I have proof, I want to act fast. I called Hop again. Hey, Hop, who was the lawyer your aunt used for the divorce? I asked. I don't remember, he said. I can give you the number of the guy I was going to use. Hell no, I snapped back. He was too damn friendly. I remember him going on and on about how all this sitting around and discussing was bullshit. He talked about being reasonable and sharing. All this crap about shared decision-making and maturity just blows my mind. I need that lawyer your aunt had who got your uncle off the hook. Okay, calm down, Luke. I'll call her right now and get the number. Are you even sure something's going on? He asked. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it, I said. Okay, I'll call you back, he said and hung up. For the next few minutes, I was actually doing work. I was processing orders for several customers and organizing the delivery of the goods they needed overseas. When the phone rang, I picked it up on the first ring. Her name is Ann Wilson, Hop said. She works at the Hart Agency. From what I hear, she's the meanest divorce attorney in the state. They call her the Barracuda. Are you sure you want to? Thanks, Hop, I said. Then I hung up. I called the information desk and got a listing for the Hart Agency. I asked the person who answered if I could speak to Ann Wilson. The phone rang again as my call was transferred. What do you want? The voice in the receiver was so loud and angry that it scared me. I immediately started to hang up. There was so much rage and frustration in that single question that I wondered what could have made such a person work for the public. I'm looking for Ann Wilson, I said politely. Excuse me, it's her, said an almost melodic female voice. I'm sorry, I thought you were my ex-husband. He's been calling me early in the morning lately, just to mess with me. I found my lawyer. I was sure of it for two reasons. First, from the sound of her voice, I was sure this woman's balls were scraping the ground as she went. I knew she wouldn't take a single prisoner, and that was what I wanted. Secondly, she was divorced, so I was sure she could understand the rage and pain that a hard breakup could cause. I'd like you to represent me in my divorce, I said. I'm sorry, I don't think so, she said. Lately, because of my reputation, I've been getting a lot of calls from men who want me to represent them, so their wives don't hire me. In my opinion, if you cheated on her, you deserve what's coming your way. If you guys would just think about something with a brain in your head for once, the world would be a better place. Can you get off your soapbox and wait for me to explain this to you? 
I asked sharply. First of all, I've never cheated on my wife in all the time we've been together. She's the one cheating on me. And she's not only cheating on me, she's cheating on our beautiful little daughter. I've been feeling like a single dad for months now, and I've finally found out why. I don't have any proof yet, but I have a private investigator working on it. I want to act quickly to get this sorted out over the summer and lessen the problems for my daughter. I'm so sorry, she said. Her whole demeanor has changed. We made an appointment later that day to discuss the details and hung up. For the rest of the workday, I tried to focus on work, but I kept getting distracted. I kept trying to figure out what had gone wrong. For a few seconds, I kneaded my hands and thought about where I had failed her. Then I sobered up and started trying to figure out how stupid she had to be to cheat on me. Shortly before three in the afternoon, my phone rang. I answered it. A soft and sultry voice with a hint of a southern accent instantly brought back memories. I hope it's okay that I'm calling you, she said. I just wanted to remind you that our first little meeting is tomorrow afternoon. I was lost in that voice again. Okay, I said. Go ahead and remind me. That elicited a laugh from her. Even her laughter was cute and funny. The kids will get there around five, she said. We have to be there a little earlier. Wear something you can run in. Tomorrow we'll probably just do a slow, easy group jog. Bye. All my thoughts of Dana were gone. When Gianna said goodbye, the word meant much more than just goodbye. There was a hint of playfulness in it, and even a bit of, I don't want to stop hanging out with you. It also made me wonder if she just meant bye. I was sure I was just imagining it, though. I picked Sasha up from school and we drove home. We played Little Big Planet together on our PlayStation 3 for a few hours. I cooked grilled steaks and a small salad for us. After dinner, Sasha went to her room to do her homework and talk to one of her friends. I, on the other hand, went to the computer to look up new stuff for my Mustang on some of my favorite parts websites. After convincing myself that my car really needed a chin spoiler, I went back to the PS3 and started watching the Blu-ray disc of Iron Man 2. I turned the volume up enough that I didn't hear Dana when she walked in. She wrapped her arms around me and tried to kiss me. I stood up quickly as if she'd startled me and moved away from her. That will serve you well, she laughed. You know you shouldn't turn the surround sound up that loud. How will Sasha sleep? Excuse me, I said, turning back to the TV. Wait a minute, she said. What smells so good? Did you fry something? Just steaks for me and Sasha, I replied. We didn't think you'd want to eat when you got here. You usually shower right away and relax after meetings. She had a hard time meeting my gaze, so she just nodded and left for the bedroom. I couldn't tell if I'd given up something or if she was just feeling guilty. And I didn't care which, I just wanted to get it over with. I thought about all the financial and other items Ann Wilson wanted me to provide by our next meeting to quickly facilitate the divorce. I required income and tax returns from both of us, as well as a list of assets and their value. She also asked me to list all of our responsibilities to Sasha and who handles them. Since our state is a community property state, it was clear that any property settlement would likely be 50 50ths. I liked the idea that we would just walk away from each other, she would keep hers, and I would keep mine. Since I was making more money, I was hoping the judge would rule that child support would balance out the alimony. I would keep my daughter and Dana would get free visitation. She wouldn't have to pay child support and I wouldn't. Since the house we live in belongs to my parents, there is no way she could have gotten it. However, we would have to split the furniture and everything else. Again, I just wanted it to be over so I could move on. Are you going to bed? She asked after a while. Maybe later, I said. Luke, what's going on? She asked. For the last two days, you've been avoiding me. I want to know why. Did I do something to upset you? Dana, for the past two months, you've been distant and acting strange towards Sasha and me. Do you want to tell us why? What about your mood swings? We never know what kind of Dana will come home. Maybe we're just trying to give you some space to get your head out of your ass. I wasn't going to start this, but it all came out. I stood up and grabbed my car keys before I said something I later regretted. Where are you going? She asked. It seemed like she was about to cry. I'm going to take a drive to calm down before things get out of hand, I said.
Do you want me to come with you? She asked. Maybe we could talk. No, there's no point in waking Sasha up because we won't get along, I said. Or were you planning on leaving our daughter alone in the house while we were gone? Maybe you just forgot about her because I usually take care of her? Dana started to cry. She reached for me and I pulled away from her. Luke, I love you and I love Sasha too. You know that. You have a funny way of showing it, I growled, closing the door. Driving my Mustang at night has a magic of its own. The faces of the people on the street as I drove past them were funny to watch. They heard the car's engine a little before they saw it. They tended to stare at me long after I passed them. As I drove, I wondered what was going through Dana's mind. She had a husband and daughter who worshipped the ground she walked on. Why would she risk it all to have fun with some other guy? Our sex life up until two days ago wasn't bad, even after 14 years. I wasn't huge either, but above average in size. I just couldn't figure out what was wrong. Maybe she was bored with what we were doing? Maybe I was just acting like a guy? Maybe it wasn't just about sex. I think guys have always assumed that if someone cheats, it has to do with sex. Maybe I did or didn't do something in a completely different area. But it had to be more than just sex or me because she treated Sasha differently too? I drove and wasted gas for about an hour before heading home. When I got there, all the lights were out, so I figured Dana was asleep. I took a quick shower and slid into bed. I intended to stay as far away from her as possible, at least until I found out if she was really cheating on me. During the trip, I was very productive. I came up with at least five or six reasons for her flighty behavior. She may have had a secret gambling addiction. One of the women who was friends with my mom went through this. She would sneak out of the house and go to the casino at least once or twice a week for several years before her husband found out. He never would have known about it if she hadn't messed up her affairs and started making mortgage payments. When she missed the third payment and the mortgage company called him at work, all hell broke loose. But in the end, they helped her out and stayed together. The other possibility was that Dana was addicted to some kind of substance. Almost immediately after my head hit the pillow, she slid over to me. I'm sorry, she said. I've been stressed out at work lately. I guess I didn't realize it until you told me. Is there anything I can do to make you forgive me? Treat Sasha better, I snapped back. Well, now I was thinking of something a little more personal, she said as she stroked my stomach with her hands. When her fingers came close to my pubes, I grabbed her hand and pulled it away. What happened? she asked. I could tell she was in shock. In 14 years, I'd never been in a mood. I need to get some sleep, I said. I have a big day tomorrow, so I'm going to need all my strength. Then I rolled over and moved further away from her. But, she began. Good night, Dana, I said. The next morning, I felt great for some reason. I went through the files in our home office and made copies of all the tax documents Ann Wilson had requested. Within hours, Barracuda would have all the information needed for my divorce. Now all we needed was proof. I really hoped little Joe had something for me. Over the years, I've heard a few phrases from married and divorced couples that I guessed I always assumed to be true. One of them was the old chestnut about how love can't be turned off like a light switch unless you have never truly loved someone. Now I truly believe that this is not true. I think it all depends on the situation and the people involved. In my case, up until three days before, I loved Dana with all my heart and soul. She is the mother of my daughter, and I really thought and hoped we would grow old together. But the realization that she had betrayed me just changed the way I felt about her. If she had cheated on me, we could still grow old, but not together. The second old tale was that a husband never knows when his wife is cheating. Guys are always painted as clueless. Unless the poor guy came home early and discovered the proverbial strange car in the driveway, he never found out. Sometimes the wife would come up with a clever lie and convince the guy that nothing was going on. Basically, the only way for the husband to find out was to catch them in the act. None of those scenarios described me. I needed to cut Dana out of my life, but it wasn't possible yet. She was Sasha's mother. For at least the next eight years, we'd have custody issues. Then we'd both probably have to attend graduation parties and her wedding. Then there would be babies being born. Hopefully in a few years I'll find someone else and be done with her cheating. Maybe my skin will stop getting goosebumps at the sight of her too. At lunchtime, I faxed copies of the documents to Anne's office so she could get to work on the paperwork. 
After lunch, I felt like the day was dragging on. I kept remembering how much I loved Dana when we first started dating. I needed to pull myself together. My mood swings were just as bad as hers. I alternately hated her to the core and wished she didn't so we could stay together. I thought about marriage counseling. I thought about trying to forgive her and forget about it. These thoughts lasted for about a picosecond. There was no way I could forgive her if that was true. I also thought about the fact that it was my fault too. After all, I had fantasized about other women from time to time. All week, I'd even mentally fallen in love with Dana's new teacher. But there was a difference between thinking about someone in favorable terms and actually having fun with someone outside of marriage. Most guys are always looking at hot women and thinking about it. But when you actually do something about it, the line has already been crossed. Dana called me at work, but I didn't answer her call. She called my cell phone, but I didn't answer it either. She left me a message telling me how much she loved me and how we needed to talk. I deleted it after listening to it. I picked Sasha up from school at the usual time. She was excited about something, but I didn't remember what was supposed to happen that day. Dad, are we going to eat first or go straight to the park? Sasha asked. Who said we were going to the park today? I asked. Oh no, she said. You forgot, didn't you? You were supposed to be helping the track and field club today. We drove home and I changed into a track suit. I decided that the volunteers and coaches would be dressed like that. I was about to leave when Sasha told me to get my iPad. I took it out and handed it to her. Thanks, Daddy, she said. That way I'll have something to do while I watch you watch people run. When we got to the park, I looked around to see where all the kids were. The park was shaped like a bowl. The parking lot was at the top, and to get to the trails and other activities the park offered, you had to walk down the slope. Past the unused tennis courts, I saw a group of familiar faces, as well as a few parents. I saw a couple of children with whom Sasha occasionally socialized, and their mothers or fathers. I walked over and joined the group. A few minutes later, I looked back up the hill and saw an SUV pull into the parking lot next to my Mustang. Gianna got out of it and was talking to Sasha. As she walked down the hill, I noticed that she was also wearing a tracksuit. I think every father there swallowed amicably when she walked up and introduced herself. One guy who just seconds before had been talking about how excited he would be when the teacher arrived and could leave, sat down to watch. Inwardly, I laughed until I fell over. Apparently, it had the same effect on them as it had on me. Wait until they hear that voice and her accent. Gianna gathered all the kids and introduced me as her assistant or co-coach. She explained that this was just a cross-country running club, not an official team. For now, we would get together to run twice a week. But she told them that she expects them to run on their own as well. If all works out well, there will be tryouts for the cross-country team in the fall, and we will compete against other elementary schools. She told the parents that they could either stay or come back in an hour to pick up their kids. Most of them left before she got ready to go jogging. When she took off her gym pants and stood in shorts, all the men decided to stay. We gathered all the kids together, and after a short warm-up, we went for a slow group run on the trails. I took a position behind the group in case anyone got injured or couldn't keep up with the very slow pace we were running at. After a while, it became clear that all the kids were capable of running faster than we were running that day. Even the, uh, fat kids were ahead of me. On the second lap, Gianna slowly came back to me. Hi, she said, smiling. Are you okay? I nodded my head. That bad? She asked. I thought about it, and I guess I wanted to apologize to you. What do you need to apologize for? I asked. Well, I went over our conversation a few times in my head. I guess I was a little insensitive, she said. How were you supposed to know I was stupid enough to believe my wife was on the PTA and never checked the meeting dates? I asked. It's not stupidity, she said. It's called trust. It's a good thing. It's the sign of a good person. If I'm a good person, why do I feel so bad? I asked her. It hurts a lot at first, she said. But then after a while, it gets worse. I smiled at her facial expression and tone. Some of the kids even noticed the sour note in her voice. Sounds like you've been there, I said. But I find that so hard to believe. Because I'm pretty, she laughed. Her laugh was completely stupid. It started as a giggle and ended with a snort. 
My ex was so jealous of every man who even squinted at me that I couldn't go anywhere or do anything. I really wish I had a man by my side who would give me the simple gift you give your wife. Trust. It really means a lot. If you don't trust someone, how can you believe you love them? On the other hand, even though he didn't trust me as far as he could throw my car, he was the one who slept with me. My mouth dropped open. He was an explorer. So after he conquered me, he needed to seek out new conquests to keep from getting bored. He fought for a divorce until the last minute. But eventually it was over and I moved on with my life. That was three years ago and now I am just at the point where I can tolerate men around me. Then I'll try my best not to act like a man, I said. Damn men, I hate them all. I don't hate men, she smiled. It's just that I've been through a lot of bitterness and self-pity. Where I come from, if you can't make your man happy, you're just not much of a woman. Uh, you look a lot like a woman, I muttered. The whole time we were running together, I had a hard time taking my eyes off her ass. Her legs also seemed incredibly long and sensual. Noticed, huh? She smiled. Her smile told me a lot of things. For one thing, she definitely interested me on some level. She also let me know that she knew the effect she had on men and didn't mind bragging about it and flirting a little. After the second lap, we took the kids back to the clearing where we started the race. We had them do some stretching exercises, told them how great they did, and sent them home with their parents. Several parents came up to us to ask questions. Most of them wanted to know how I became her assistant and if there were still openings. As we were walking back to the parking lot after the last kid left, Sasha jumped out of the car. Daddy, can we go to Pizza Hut? She asked. I guess so, I smiled. Okay, she said. This is Miss Marshall's favorite restaurant. So, Miss Marshall, since this is your favorite restaurant, I hinted. Well, Mr. McCain, I'd love to join you. But why don't we do it in 45 minutes? That way the two of us can shower and change. You have to be comfortable to eat pizza, she laughed. Okay, see you later, Sasha said. Come on, Dad, you need to take a shower. Forty-five minutes later, Sasha and I got out of the Mustang in front of the only pizza hut in town. We walked inside and took a table. We were looking over the menu when Gianna appeared, and all the guys in the place turned to look at her. She smiled at me and I could feel it across the room. I could also feel the stares of all the guys present. It got me thinking about what it would be like to be in a relationship with someone like that. How would you deal with all the guys constantly hitting on her? I acted like a gentleman and pulled out a chair for her from behind the table. We had a great time and ate a lot of pizza. Sasha spent some time playing video games, so Gianna and I had time to talk. It was a magical night. Gianna asked me how things were going in my marriage and I brought her up to speed. She shook her head and said that things would get much worse before they got better. Wait until you're in a lawyer's office and you're arguing over a coffee table that neither of you want, she says. You'll just get to the point where you don't want to give that person a single thing more than they've already taken from you. Sorry, this must be a terrible first date for you, she smiled. Is it a date? said I. I wasn't sure I was ready for a date yet. What if I found out that Dana wasn't cheating on me? What if it was just a gamble? Then the cheater would turn out to be me, wouldn't it? I knew I should say something to her about it, but damn it, I didn't. I just let the night go the way it went. Sasha was so tired from playing video games and hanging out with the kids at Pizza Hut that I had to carry her into the house and put her to bed. We walked around a lot longer than I had planned, mostly because Gianna was so easy to talk to. She was like a wind-up toy. All you had to do was wind her up and watch her work, and she would tell you anything you wanted to know, about anything. I got into bed and tried not to wake Dana, but she rolled over and hugged me as soon as I was in bed. Where did you guys go? she asked. Pizza Hut, I replied. I wondered why your iPad wasn't on the table. Sasha was playing with her friends and eating pizza while you were on the internet looking for car parts, right? You're a good dad, honey. And you're a great husband. I'm sorry for the way I acted, she said. I love you, Luke. Can we start having sex already? She came to bed determined to give me a few sloppy seconds of some bastardization. There was no way I was going to entertain her until I knew if she was cheating on me or not. Not good today, I said, leaving her even more shocked than the night before. 
I think I have a cold, and I don't want to pass that on to you. I wished I could read Dana's mind as she sat there looking at me. Did she really think I knew what was going on, or did she think I was still stupid? I left quickly again the next morning, waking Sasha up and asking her not to tell her mom about the night before. She hardly ever talks to me anyway, Daddy, so why should this morning be any different? Sasha said. A couple of hours later, I was sitting at my desk, deep in thought as usual, when a package was delivered to me via messenger. I signed for it and opened it. The envelope contained two floppy disks and a stack of papers. I inserted one disk into the computer and started it up. There were four files on the disk. I started the one with the previous Wednesday's date on it. It showed Dana walking into a cheap motel with a very tall guy. I could barely make out who he was. Then in the room, I saw them getting close. It was Chuck Connors, the guy she worked with. I watched long enough to make sure they weren't playing cards. Then I turned off the disc. I think some guys would want to watch it in its entirety. Even sicker guys would probably want to watch it multiple times and maybe even jerk off to it. And I just felt like throwing up. Gianna was right, of course. As bad as it was to think about her cheating on me, it was much worse to see it. Especially when I saw some of the things she'd let him do to her that she'd never let me think about. I made a copy of the DVD to send to Anne. Then I copied the disc of phone conversations and sent a copy of both discs and the paperwork detailing who Chuck Connors was when they got together and other information. I called Ponderosa Investigations and thanked them for a job well done. I also declined their services because they were no longer needed and were expensive. Anne called me a few hours later. She said everything was ready. The paperwork was ready. She just needed Chuck's name so I could sue him too. In our state, you couldn't sue for alienation of affection or anything like that. I sued him for mental anguish for the stress he helped my daughter and I go through because of his affair with Dana. Anne told me that there was a very real possibility that we wouldn't get a dime from Chuck. We sued him so that his wife and family would find out what he had done and basically ruin his life. If we had sued the company they worked for, they both probably would have been fired. And since the lawsuit against him was in the public domain, Anyone who decided to hire him in the future and did a background check could have stumbled across it. It was a nice touch. Anne was clearly worth every dime she charged me. She also explained to me that, unlike what was shown on TV, we were not going to roll out all of our ammunition together. That would have been stupid. First, we filed for divorce. After the settlement agreement was signed and approved by a judge. Then we sued Chuck and company. That way, at the time the judge approved, Dana would have her own income, so the settlement agreement would be relatively fair. Then, after the judge approved it, we sued Chuck and company. Since Dana would have lost her job after the settlement was approved, we would not have been at fault for leaving her destitute. Anne also told me that I should listen to the audio conversations on the second disc, if I hadn't already, because Dana was thinking about ending the relationship between her and Chuck. Anne wanted to know if there was a difference for me, and I told her no. I told her I needed a day or two to figure out how and when I wanted to serve the papers. She decided that we should do it at Dana's work. The embarrassment and humiliation she would cause if she did it, there was excellent. It would also serve as a notice to the upper management of the company that problems were brewing. I hung up the phone and although I guessed I should be happy, a smile was the furthest thing from my mind. I don't know how I made it through the whole weekend. Saturday I took Sasha and a couple of her friends to the zoo. Sunday, I washed and polished the car again. On Monday, I couldn't sit through another day of work, so I called in sick and took my Mustang to the shop to have a chin spoiler installed. The instructions said it was easy and anyone could do it, but I didn't want to take a chance in my condition and ruin the car. While I waited for the technicians to install it, I called Anne and told her that Dana could be served on Wednesday. As soon as I hung up, it rang again. Dana's number came up on the caller ID. Why aren't you at work? She asked. I'm still not feeling very good, so I decided to work on the car a little bit, I said. Why didn't you at least tell me so I'd know where you were and not look stupid calling your office? She asked. We're supposed to be married, you know. Sometimes I can't tell, I said slowly. Luke, you know I love you, she said. And I know it was my fault that this happened, but I don't know how to fix it without making it worse. Can't we just promise each other to never let work stress get in the way of our family ever again? Okay, Dana, no more stress at home, I said. Me too, she said. 
Never again, I promise. What a load of crap, I said, hanging up the phone. I couldn't believe she thought I'd fall for that work stress crap. She really thinks I'm stupid. The phone rang again. I was about to tell Dana what I thought, since I was so angry with her, but it wasn't her. Why aren't you at work? Gianna asked. Hearing her voice made me feel better. I'm depressed, I said. I explained everything to her and told her where I was. Okay, that's not why I called, she said sharply. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to drive you to despair by talking about my ruined life, I said. You're not humoring me, she said. And I'm willing to listen to anything you want to talk about. I'm just afraid that if we start telling each other our problems all the time, we'll become friends. Oh, I said, suddenly feeling worse. I thought we were already friends. Oh, hell no, she snapped suddenly. Get that thought out of your head immediately. Well, I'm going to let you go, I said sadly. I don't want to waste your time. I called you, Luke, she reminded him. I wanted to ask you about our second date. What second date? I asked. I thought... Luke, you never want to be a girl's friend. And I don't want you to think of me as your friend, she said seriously. When I got divorced, I had a lot of friends. Most of them were women, but there were a few guys too. A lot of my friends called to make me feel better about my divorce. Even guys called me. The problem is that once you get into the friend zone, it's very hard to change your status. I never once thought about entertaining any of the guys I considered friends. I don't want you to think of me as a friend. Okay, I'm confused, I said. What? Don't worry about it, she smiled. I'll deal with it. You're still in shock. I'm just trying to make sure that in a few weeks, when you're really ready to move on, I'll be first in line. What line? I asked. You work for a relatively large company, correct? She asked. I said yes. That means that when the news of your divorce gets out, there will be a lot of women after you. And they'll all be standing behind me, she smirked. Gianna, if you're in line, there won't be a line, I said. I'm not stupid enough to let you go. Oh, finally some flattery. Now that I know you're interested, let's talk about a second date, she said. I'm torn, you know. Torn about what? I asked. I was still totally confused. No wonder women think we don't understand everything. Well, a second date is a little early for a romantic cross-dressing date. But it's perfect for another fun little get-to-know-you date. The big decision is, do we bring Sasha along? She asked. Because I know she likes me, but we're supposed to have our first kiss goodnight after our second date, and I'm not sure she likes me that much. Seeing some woman press her lips against your father's can be uncomfortable. Are you planning on pressing your lips against me? I wheezed. The tightness in my pants made me very glad I was in the office alone. Definitely, she laughed. After all, we have to follow protocol. It was all I could do not to kiss you at Pizza Hut. And when is that going to happen? I asked. This woman had a way of making me forget everything that was going on in my life except for her. The sooner the better, she said. How about tomorrow afternoon after practice? I'll make a picnic lunch and the four of us can have a picnic right in the park when everyone goes home. We can even roast marshmallows. Which four are you talking about? I asked. You, me, Sasha, and her best friend Beth, she smirked. That way Sasha will have someone to hang out with while we talk. Okay, I said, hoping my head would stop spinning. See you later, bye, she said. That bye emphasized the nasality of her voice and accent. If all country girls were like her, I wondered why anyone ever left the South. Picking Sasha up from school, I looked around the parking lot but didn't see Gianna's Jeep. She's not here, Dad, Sasha laughed. She had to go shopping and you and I know why. I looked at Sasha. She was smiling. I guessed she was okay. When we got home, Dana was in the kitchen making dinner. Sasha and I looked at her like she was an alien. Why are you looking at me like that? she asked. We didn't know you could cook, Sasha said. Why are you home? I asked. I just decided not to work overtime today, Dana smiled. I just wanted to spend some time with my family. 
When are they coming? Sasha asked. I'm busy today. I have a lot of homework. I'm going to take some pictures of the car with the new chin spoiler and maybe get out on the roads around the airport where there isn't a lot of traffic and try it out, I said. Sasha walked to the kitchen and grabbed a couple slices of the pizza we'd brought the other day. She heated them up in the microwave while Dana watched her. See you later, Dad, Sasha said, retiring to her room. I was left standing there alone with Dana. I've been thinking, she said, smiling at me. What do you think about having another baby? It was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I managed to keep a straight face. I didn't laugh in her face, and I didn't throw up or vomit. Now I'm going to get my camera and take pictures, I said. What about my idea? She whined. I wanted to start working on it as soon as possible. I'll think about it, I said, and headed for the exit of the house. I took about 50 pictures of the car from different angles with my digital camera. I had shots of the car in all stages of its development, from stock condition to the present. I hated to leave my daughter alone with Dana, but I really needed to get out of there. As I drove down the road, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. There were only two reasons for Dana to suddenly become so enamored. Either she was really trying to save our marriage, or she was trying to dump more of her crap on me. If she was really trying to save our marriage, shouldn't I have at least given her a chance to try? Then came the sudden urge to get pregnant again. Was this another tactic to save our marriage? She somehow suspected that I knew about her affair and thought that getting pregnant again would keep me from leaving her cheating. Or there was something even worse behind it. Maybe she was already pregnant with his child and was trying to get me to entertain her so she could then claim the baby was mine? That was another reason I wasn't going to have sex with her. Then of course came the guilt. Was I suddenly so determined to cut her out of my life because she'd hurt me and broken our marriage vows? Or because I had someone better? Since we were still married, wasn't I just as bad as she was? Obviously, I started dating before I even filed for divorce. I didn't initiate anything, but I kept doing it anyway. I guess it all came down to timing. Dana had been cheating on me for over a month. In my mind, the moment she spread her legs for Chuck Connors, our marriage was over. So, at least for me, it was well within my rights to seek happiness elsewhere. As far as children go, if Dana was pregnant, we would have done a DNA test. If it had been my child, I would have paid child support and been involved in his life. But with Dana, it was over. After what she did, there was no going back. I drove around the city much longer than I needed to. I enjoyed sitting in the car, but eventually I had to get home. Naturally, Dana was still awake. Ready, Daddy? She asked. No, I answered honestly. Dana, our problems are much more serious than you realize. You treating me and Sasha like crap for almost two months and then deciding everything was fine is not okay with me. I don't see how having another baby is going to improve an already shitty situation. She looked genuinely hurt. But Luke, I love you, she said. I love you too, Dana, I said. And I meant it. But I don't think that can be fixed overnight. She looked really hurt. Don't worry, Dana, I said. It doesn't mean you're already pregnant. We haven't had sex in weeks, so don't worry about it. That's probably why I'm so horny, she said. I miss you. She put her arm around me and ran her hand over my crotch. Dana, that's not going to happen. Now get away from me, I snapped at her. I walked away to the bedroom and left her there crying. The next morning, all the tension in me was gone. Dana was still in the living room. She looked awful. I showered, got dressed, and went to work. After work, I changed my clothes in the office, picked up Sasha, and went to the practice. There, as usual, children and parents were gathered there. I noticed a few women looking at me. Some of them were married, but still staring. Maybe there was something in the goddamn water? Married women going after other people's men seemed to be an epidemic. Hey, you, Gianna said. Remember, I'm first in line. She ran her hands around my waist in a friendly but intimate manner. There was nothing inappropriate about it. It wasn't even a hug, but it was familiar enough to let the women present know that she was claiming me. We did the same group run as last time, but increased the pace a bit. Just to the point where all the kids could keep it up, but some were uncomfortable. Those who could easily keep up the pace would probably become members of our track and field team. The rest would stay with the club until they were ready to move up to a higher level. 
After practice, most of the kids were tired and couldn't wait to get into their parents' waiting cars. Of course, most of the dads wanted to stay and groom Gianna for as long as possible, but in the end, it was just the two of us and Beth. Beth's mom didn't pick her up, she spent the night with Sasha. We walked to our cars and drove to the picnic area. Sasha and Beth sat on a bench, playing games and watching videos on my iPad, while Gianna and I set up the food. Then the magic began. We spread a blanket and sat down on it. For a long time, we just stared at each other. There was a look in her eyes that I had never seen in Dana's before. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe longing mixed with despair and a little bit of hope. And it was all directed at me. Too soon, she said. Then she nodded her head toward the girls. But hold that thought. We talked about our life and what we want out of it. We talked about dreams and why some things are non-negotiable. Among them were faithfulness, honesty, and trust. I asked her why no man in his right mind would cheat on her, and she told me that most of the guys she dated only saw her for her looks. Once they got used to her looks, she became just another woman to them, and there was always someone prettier. So what she was really looking for was a man who would love her for her soul, not her looks. She loved her job very much, but her heart was really in a simple matter. She just wanted to be someone's wife and mother. We also talked about what I wanted. My needs turned out to be remarkably similar. The girls came over for a snack a few times and ended up just sitting down on the blanket with us. Daddy, is Miss Marshall your girlfriend now? Sasha asked. I think so, Beth said. But maybe they're just friends because they don't kiss. My mom has three boyfriends and they all kiss her all the time. Well, I guess we should go home, I said. I'll see you at practice on Thursday, Gianna said as she stood up. Uh, I said, you should follow me home. It's time to move on. What exactly, she asked. Divorce and the rest of life, I smiled. We loaded the kids into Gianna's Jeep and drove to my house. On the way, I called Chuck. He was on his way home, which meant Dana had to be on his way too. Chuck, this is Lucas McCain, I said cheerfully. Do I know you? he asked. I could hear the tension in his voice. I was sure this asshole knew who I was. We don't need to play any games, Chuck, I said. You've been entertaining my wife Dana for about two months now, so we should be old friends, considering what we've shared. It was her idea, he said quickly. His voice turned into a whimper. Chuck, I don't care whose idea it was, I just think it's time for us as adults to sit down and discuss our options. So, unless you want me to visit your wife and discuss all this with her, you'd better come over to my house right now. I'll be home in about 10 minutes. If the drive takes you longer than 15 minutes, I'll visit you at home. Dana got home before we did. I saw her car as we pulled up. As soon as Gianna's Jeep stopped moving, the two girls got out of it and ran toward the house. I stayed behind to talk to Gianna. This should be interesting, I told her. Luke, don't do anything crazy, she said. She climbed onto the hood of my car and pulled me to her. Trust me, I said. I'm not planning anything stupid. I have nothing against Chuck. He's not the one who betrayed me, Dana is. And all I want from her is a divorce so I can move on with my life. That should go very easily. Well, you forgot something, she said. Then she leaned over and kissed me. For one very long moment, the world stopped spinning. Time stopped and everything around me ceased to matter. The only thing that broke the spell was the scream of Dana running toward us from the house. What are you doing? Dana shouted. Moving on, I said cheerfully. Continue what? Dana hissed. I held up my hand to warn her. Oh good, Chuck's here, I said as he pulled into our driveway. Chuck got out of the car and almost stumbled as he looked at Gianna. He couldn't take his eyes off her. I gave her another hug and she got in her car and pulled out of the driveway. My God, what a beautiful woman, Chuck said. Dana just sat there, growing paler by the second. What are you doing here, Chuck? She snapped back. Did I forget something at the office? I've invited Chuck over to my place, I said. Let's go inside, where we can talk in peace. We entered the house and ended up in my living room. Who was that woman? Chuck asked as soon as he sat down. My plan to remain calm and reasonable suddenly went out the window. Chuck was three inches taller than me and weighed about 20 pounds, but it didn't matter. 
I hit him as hard as I could. His nose flared and he fell backwards so hard he knocked over a chair. He got up, felt his nose, saw the blood and stared at me. He tried to get up, but I kicked him in the chest and he fell back down again. Why did you hit me? He shouted. Because I called you here so we could talk, I hissed. You're a real piece of shit, Chuck. You're already married, and you keep going around trying to entertain other people's wives. You've already ruined my marriage to Dana. But before we could talk about it, you're sniffing around like you're interested in Gianna. I glared back at him, and he backed away. You wanted Dana, you got her. But Gianna is off limits. If you ever look at her again, I swear I'll kill you. She has a lot more common sense than Dana, but just the thought of you looking at her pisses me off, I said. Chuck, I have nothing against you. It wasn't you who betrayed me, it was my wife. If I should be mad at anyone, it's her. But I'm not mad at anyone. In fact, I'm happy. Dana is yours. Take her and live happily ever after. Are you kidding? He said. I don't need Dana. I already have a wife. And she's better looking. It was just sex, and not even good sex. I just like those big old tits. The rest of her is worthless. Believe me, if she wasn't so easy to get, I wouldn't bother. You're a jerk, Dana yelled. I don't want you either. That's why I broke up with you the other day. I was starting to think Luke knew something was going on and you weren't worth my marriage. Then why did you call me today, you old whore? Chuck snarled. Because Luke hasn't slept with me in over a week, she said. You guys can decide that when you get back to Chuck's or wherever you're going, I said. What are you talking about, Luke? Dana asked. Fear suddenly replaced the anger in her voice. I already told you that you two have been continuing your relationship for over a month now. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to end. I hope you two will be very happy together. I really think so. If all three of us take on packing her stuff, you can be out of here in 20 minutes too. Or you can just pack some of her stuff and come back tomorrow for the rest while I'm at work, I said. They both looked at me like I had three heads. Confusion was written all over their faces, and Chuck's face was hard to read as his nose and cheeks swelled. I'm not taking her anywhere, he said. Oh yes, she is, Chuck, I said. I don't care where you take her, but she's yours now. You can move her in with your wife and kid or pay for her motel room or buy her an apartment. But if you don't want to lose your marriage tonight, you have to do something. Luke, Dana said slowly. I swear to you that I love only you. Chuck was just a mistake. It was never about love. He just caught me when I was feeling old and vulnerable. He really flattered me and made me feel better. You know how self-conscious I've always been about my height and figure. I saw tears running down her cheeks. Please give me another chance. I know it was a terrible thing to do, but women need to know that they are attractive and that they are still capable of turning a man on. Dana, have I ever done anything to make you feel unattractive? I always told you that I wanted us to grow old together. You and I had more than just looks and sex. I really loved you. You didn't just cheat on me. You cheated on our daughter, all of our memories, the vows we made to each other, and all of our dreams for the future. You've treated us like crap for the last two months, but it's over now, I said calmly. What about that girl you just kissed? You're doing the same thing, she snarled. No, Dana, it's different, I said. That was the first time I kissed her. We hadn't had sex yet, and I only met her because of your lies. What lies? Dana asked. Gianna is Sasha's teacher, I said. If you've actually been going to parent-teacher conferences for the past two months, I never would have met her. Here's how it's going to work, I said. Tomorrow my lawyer will serve you with the divorce papers. She has prepared two sets. Which set we file is your choice, Dana. Either you sign the nice ones that list irreconcilable differences as the reason for divorce, or we'll go the hard way. As far as the paperwork goes, we'll split all the bills 50 50ths. I get to keep the house since my parents own it, and you can't take it anyway. We have joint custody of Sasha. She will live with me, and you will visit her as often as you want. Luke, I don't want a divorce, please, she begged. I'll do anything. I just want another chance. You can entertain this girl a few times to get your revenge. And then we'll just move on and get over it. You and Chuck just had sex, right? I asked. Both of them nodded quickly. Well, 
Things with Gianna are much more than that, I said. As soon as I'm free of you, I'll marry her. Why don't you two discuss it after I leave, Chuck said. Because she's coming with you, Chuck, I snapped back. Either you take her with you, or your marriage will be broken up before you even get home. I know you're hurting, Luke, Dana said. I'm going to go and stay with Mom for a few days until you calm down, and then we can talk. Dana, you're a grown woman. Do whatever you want, as long as it involves getting out of here, I said. I then went to the kitchen to get something to drink. The next few weeks were interesting. I focused on spoiling my daughter and getting to know Gianna better. We did various things together, but we didn't have sex. We saved that for our wedding night. Dana called me at work and at home several times a day. I didn't answer any of her calls or return any of her calls. But I let her take Sasha whenever she wanted. I didn't want to stop her from spending time with our daughter. Her mother and father also called me to see if I could take her back. They told me that it was a crime to break up a family over one stupid mistake that Dana would regret for the rest of her life. Dana has the right to raise her daughter and live a happy life. I told them that I have a right to a happy life too, and I can't be happy with a woman who cheated on me. Especially not with one who did it for over a month and was probably pregnant with someone else's child. Dana went to Gianna at school and begged her to let us give it another try. Incredibly, they sat down and talked about it. Gianna told her about how her first marriage had broken up and what it was like to do your best for someone and they cheat on you for no reason. I think that gave Dana an idea of what I was going through. I think what hit Dana the hardest was when she came into the house to talk to me and saw Gianna and I sitting together on our long porch swing. Gianna sat outlining her papers and I dozed off with my head in her lap. Sasha sat on the front step with her phone glued to her head, chatting animatedly as all teenagers do about some TV show. We looked like a family. A family that loves each other and is very comfortable being together. And then it hit me what she had thrown away. She started crying as she looked at us. I was asleep so I didn't see it, but Gianna woke me up, kissing me and pointing to Dana's receding back. Talk to her, Gianna said. I got up and caught Dana before she got into the car. Dana, did you need to see me for some reason? I asked. I tried really hard, but it was hard for me to pretend to care. Why haven't you sent the papers back yet? I guess I came to talk to you about us, she snorted. You know, you're doing everything wrong. What am I doing wrong? I asked, puzzled by her statement. I've talked to a few of my friends who are divorced, she said. You had to get mad at me and fight over me. Then we were supposed to argue about everything, including custody of Sasha. Then you were supposed to move out and live in a shitty little apartment. You're supposed to be miserable and alone. And then we're supposed to work on getting back together with the clear realization that I love you, but you're not enough for me. So every once in a while I'll have a lover and you won't know about it. Or you'll pretend you don't know because you don't want us to go through the pain of almost losing each other again. Maybe you'll have a lover too, but it has to be just sex. Now she was crying. Chuck was just a sex Luke. He wasn't as good as you. I guess I just wanted someone to make me feel gross and just entertain me like when I was younger. I was tired of feeling old. For a while I had it all. I had it for the rough and tumble stuff. Then, in the last few weeks, you stopped sleeping with me and I noticed it and got annoyed, she said. I knew it was wrong and I stopped it, but you had already stopped having sex with me and I was getting desperate. So I called the asshole again. When I saw you come home with Gianna that first time, I was furious. Then when I calmed down, I realized that maybe it could be good for me. I thought that if you had sex with her, then when it was over, we would be even and I could get you back, she said. I visited her at school last week and talked to her about it. And she told me a lot of interesting things not only about you guys, but also about herself. That's when I realized that I was really in danger, that it wasn't an act. She really loves you probably as much as I do. She will never give up on you. So I decided that my only hope was to turn to you. We have been together for 16 years and married for 14 of those years. We have a child together, and until the last two months we were happy. That has to mean something. I'm not going to give up without a fight. Then I came to talk to you about it today and see if we could work something out. I wanted you to give up on the divorce. In exchange for that, I would have given you two months with her, and then we would have rebuilt our marriage and our family. But now I realize you'll never go for it. 
You love her too, and you're happy. My daughter even follows her around. You look like the family we never were. Tears flowed freely down her cheeks. I really screwed up. It wasn't supposed to be like that at all. Chuck never loved me. He was just using me. I found out he's having fun with one of the secretaries now. Everyone else at work falls into two categories. The nice people who are friendly but serious about work want nothing to do with me. And all the scrappy guys, married or single, think they have the right to just put me in a corner and try to empathize with me because I'm such a slut. I live in an apartment with my parents and sleep on their goddamn couch. I'm the laughing stock of all our old friends. Remember, Sheila, her husband Bert told her she should have an affair like me so he could get promoted like you. Half the wives in town are afraid to even think about having an affair on the side because their husbands might be the next you. Every time I call Sasha, she asks me what I want. When I answer that I just want to spend time with her, she asks why. I lost my husband, my best friend, my lover, my daughter, my home, my marriage, my future, and the man I wanted to grow old with because of a stupid affair. Chuck came out of that situation free and clear. He didn't lose a damn thing. You and Sasha seem to have gotten better. And the people in town have a lot to talk and laugh about. I'm the only one who got hurt, she cried. Is there really no way to fix this? She asked. I'm sorry, Dana, I said. You made a lot of remarks. Of course, you missed even more. For example, it doesn't matter what people told you was going to happen. Every situation is different. You were never going to get the house because it was in my family before I even met you. I never got mad at Chuck or fought for you because when we got married, you were mine. The only person who had to fight for you was Chuck. He should have fought to take you away from me, but once you cheated on me, I didn't want you anymore, so there was nothing to fight for. I broke Chuck's face because he was looking at Gianna. She's the one I want. But don't worry about Chuck. He'll get his and then another and another. As for how people treat you, you kind of get what you deserve. I was just as hurt as you were when I found out what you were doing to old Chuck. Only I didn't do anything to deserve it. Speaking of the things you lost, you didn't so much lose them as throw them away. And they were just picked up by someone who seems to appreciate them a lot more than you do. I paused and looked at her. And finally, sometimes when you break something, it just can't be fixed, Dana. The best thing you can do is move on and not make the same mistakes. It doesn't matter if you love someone for 14 years or 14 seconds. When you rip their heart out, it hurts like hell. And it doesn't matter if you thought it was going to be a fling or a long-term romance. When you break your promises to the people you love, you risk losing that love. Dana, I know this is hard for you, but especially with Sasha, you are her mother and always will be. I will never try to stop you from seeing her, and you are always welcome to come visit us anytime. You can have dinner with us or spend the holidays with us. Gianna won't mind, but we'll never get the chance again. Dana signed the papers, and our divorce was finalized. I then sued Chuck Connors for the emotional suffering he put me and my daughter through. I also sued the company he and Dana worked for. Both Dana and Chuck were fired. Chuck's wife outed him, and he eventually ran away from her. We never heard from Chuck again. Dana ended up living with her parents. She rarely left the house and became a recluse. My daughter Sasha visited her often, and they were never as close as Sasha and Gianna, but they were still better off than before. I guess I never got over how Dana had hurt me, so I never trusted her again. And even though Gianna more than healed my broken heart and gave me so much love that I never looked back, I could never bring myself to forgive Dana. Dana and Gianna had become friends over the years, and Gianna was one of the few people who could get Dana out of the house. It took 20 years and a very tragic set of circumstances for me to be able to spend any time with Dana. Sasha grew up, got married, and had a family of her own. I spent 20 wonderful, loving years with Gianna. We had no children, but that didn't matter, because Gianna loved Sasha as if she were her own. One morning, I was shocked to wake up and find Gianna cold and motionless beside me. Later, it turned out that she had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage during her sleep. She died with a smile on her face, hugging me. All the doctors swore that she died instantly and felt no pain. I became withdrawn, and for a long time I did not talk to anyone or go out for a long time. Sasha stayed with me for about six weeks, but in the end she couldn't convince me to go home to her and her family. Hell, I was 55, still young and healthy, but I just couldn't bring myself to do anything. Without Gianna's smile, life seemed meaningless. 
I drank too much and ate too little for the first two days after my daughter came home to her family. I promised her that I would call her every day, and to take care of myself, and to come visit her if I was really worried. But I didn't do any of that. The third day after my daughter left me, everything changed. I woke up to the smell of bacon cooking. Since I hadn't eaten in days, the smell was intoxicating. I wanted bacon like I had never wanted bacon before. I got up and staggered to the kitchen. What the hell are you doing here? I growled. Our daughter made me promise to take care of you before you left. In fact, she was the second of your women to ask me to do so. Gianna always told me that if anything happened to her, she expected me to get back into your life. And here I am. What if I don't want you back in my life? I asked. Why don't you just get out of here, but leave the bacon? No, she answered simply. What do you mean, no? I asked. Luke, I know you still hate me, she said. I really messed things up. I betrayed you with a man who cheated on his own wife with me. Not because he loved me, but because he wanted to use me for sex. I gave up the love of my life to get some guy. I lost you, our daughter, and the beautiful life I should have had. Here she cried a little. You know I've been going a little crazy? I've been in therapy, but it didn't help. I was bitter and angry for a long time. Then I made a new friend. She helped me realize that even though I made probably the biggest mistake of my life, I wasn't done with my life. My life was supposed to go on. I had to pick myself up and move forward. After a while, she made me start dating again. These dates I went on from time to time were usually disastrous. At first, it was because I realized that guys didn't want a serious relationship with me. They just saw a good figure and wanted to have sex with me. I'd been there before and that mistake had cost me my happiness, so I wasn't going to put up with it again. Later on, I dated some really nice guys, one of whom wanted to marry me. But Luke, I couldn't do it. My friend, who I'm sure you know is named Gianna, told me that the reason I couldn't commit to any of them was because I still love you. She and I cried at the tragedy of the whole situation. It was sad for both of us. I cried because my stupidity had cost me my love and my life with the only man I'd ever truly loved. She cried because she really was my friend. She cared about me and felt my pain, but there was no way she would have given you up. She loved you too much to do that or even separate you. She finally told me that if anything happened to her, I would have to take care of you, and then maybe I could get you back. I still didn't want to even look at Dana. The first few days were horrible. Dana came to the house every day. She threw away all my alcoholic beverages. She cleaned the house, cooked my meals, and even made me shave and clean myself up. She didn't stay long at first, but as time went on, the visits became longer and longer. After a month or so, I just got used to her presence. After two months, she stopped coming home. She just slept in the guest room. She would clean the house and do whatever she could to make my life better, and then go back to her room. Of course, there were a few incidents. I'd walk into the bathroom and see her in there. Or I'd see her coming out after a shower and catch a glimpse of her partially naked body. Three months after Gianna died, Dana made me wash the car. Of course, I was still driving the Mustang. I had four of them now. All these years later, I just couldn't bring myself to sell them or trade them in. Why do I have to wash the car? Snapped back at me. Luke, tomorrow will be three months since Gianna died. I know it hurts, but you haven't been to her grave since the funeral. This is another big step in you coming to terms with it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to hurt like hell, but you have to do it to move on with your life. She will always be a part of you and you will always remember her. But you have many years ahead of you before you join her in heaven, she said. It's a long way off, so you'll have to accept it and move on. I'll probably be dead before you see her again. Of course, I'll probably go to hell. Hell should have a special place for those who cheat on the love of their life, she said. Just imagine you and Gianna sitting on a cloud, wearing wings and playing harps while I fry my ass off below, she said with a hint of a smile. Don't worry, I smiled back. If that happened, I'd piss on you to cool you off. It was a big breakthrough for us. After that, we started talking more and doing things together. It wasn't romantic. It was more like we were just good friends, but we were both okay with that. It was over a year before we ended up in the same bed. It was her birthday and I had forgotten about it. When a card from our daughter came in the mail and reminded me of it, I felt terrible. 
I was going to rush to the store and try to buy her a crappy last-minute gift, but she told me there was something better I could get her. What do you want? I asked. One hour, tonight, fully clothed, in your bed, with your arms around me, she said nervously. It's not a gift, I said. It would mean more to me than anything else in the world, she said. I'm not asking you for sex, I just want you to hold me. So we went to bed early that night. Dana came back into the room that had once been ours. She was wearing a long and very thick flannel robe. She snuggled next to me under the covers with the biggest smile on her face. I put my arms around her and she sighed. Nothing happened that night except that we slept through the night because we both fell asleep. The next morning I woke up and she relaxed me. We got out of bed awkwardly, but for the next few days Dana walked around smiling. About a week later, Dana sprained her ankle and I had to nurse her back to health. It was the least I could do after all she had done for me. Plus, we lived in the same house, and I knew neither of us wanted her to go back to the house she had gotten from her parents after they died. After the first night of her constantly calling me at night from her room, I just moved her into my room. It was easier for me to hear her that way. Her ankle was sore for a couple weeks, and I truly believe she took advantage of that to stay in my room longer. She just seemed to enjoy having her ankle hurt. After two weeks of sleeping together, Dana never returned to her room. Neither of us ever brought it up. Then one day, about a week later, in the middle of the night, it happened. I woke up as usual to Dana snuggled against me. I couldn't help it. We'd had the best night. The next morning, we both knew we were back together, but we didn't talk about it for fear of ruining it. She kissed me very tenderly and told me that she had never stopped loving me. And I told her again that I loved her. We've been living like this ever since. We're not married, we just live together. We love each other and have sex, but are not bound by the bonds of marriage. I think we've seen how it ends and we just want to enjoy each other. Yesterday, something very funny happened. After another night of lovemaking, Dana got up to make us breakfast. We wanted to hit the road early because we are driving the Mustang to Detroit for the Woodward Dream Cruise. I had just gotten out of the shower when I heard Dana scream. No way in hell, she shouted. Not this time. Then I heard the sound of tearing paper, and then nothing. I went into the kitchen, wondering what had caused her to react so violently. I found her calmly preparing breakfast. The mail had been delivered, and there were several envelopes on the table. I noticed a few scraps of torn paper by the kitchen trash can and peeked inside to see what she had torn. Just junk mail, she said, smiling. Breakfast in 20 minutes, and then we're leaving. I nodded to her, hugged her, and then while she wasn't looking, I gathered scraps of paper from the trash can. I went to the basement and put the letter together, like a jigsaw puzzle. When I realized what it was, I laughed at the top of my lungs. It was an invitation to Dana to join the PTA. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this story, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.